tell me in that case a bit about beginning to trace that idea of Europe. Where, where, where can we begin to get a fix on that? I think there's a material answer to that question and an ideological answer to that question, and they're different. Around 800 BC, give or take, the Phoenicians of the Levantine coast sailed westwards from the modern Middle East, first to Cyprus, then to Crete, North Africa, foundation of Carthage on the North African coast, and founded a trading settlement at modern Cadiz, ancient Gadir, on the south coast of Spain. At that point, this, this new trading settlement is drawing both precious metals from southern Spain, the silver mines of, um, uh, Andal of Andalusia, and also tapping into a trading network, long pre-existing East Atlantic trading network running from Cornwall in the north down to West Africa in the south. So materially at that point, you have a world stretching from Cornwall in the north to Spain and Portugal in the southeast, as far as the Levant, uh, sorry, in the southwest, and the Levant in the southeast. So at that point, one can start to talk about Europe being physically connected from, uh, from one corner to another. But certainly around 800 BC, people aren't yet conceptualizing, aren't yet thinking of this, this world as a single continent. It seemed to us that that really is a phenomenon of the fifth century BC and in large part a consequence of the, the Persian Wars, the point at which the Greeks start defining themselves as Greeks and then as Europeans in opposition to, to Asia, to everything, to the East, the world ruled by the Persians. So I think the, um, the connections within Europe predate the emergence of an idea of, uh, of Europe. I mean, I suppose that leads me on to my next question, because in the early parts of the book, you emphasise some of the very advanced civilizations in the Near East, those Eastern empires, at a time when Greek civilization was, was, was merely nascent. And I wondered at what point, if I can put it as crudely as this, one would have bet on Greece being the place which was going to take off, because you talk about the Mediterranean takeoff. So what were the circumstances and at what point can we sort of say well that's that's a civilization which is which is bound for great things i suppose it's in the course of the period after 800 bc which peter was just talking about when the greeks also begin to send off western settlements to sicily and south italy they begin to interact with the peoples of the italian peninsula and with the peoples of modern, of modern France. There's a huge material liftoff for uh, the Greek-speaking world at that period. And it all, again, comes together uh, as a result of external pressure from the Persian world to the east, uh, which poses a major threat to their continued existence, as they conceive of it. And it's their victory over that which does indeed mark the ongoing dynamism and growth of that Greek world. You mentioned interaction there, and I, I thought one of the most fascinating aspects of the book was the way in which you chart the webs of interaction, all the webs of contact, the way language, the way you can use linguistic clues in order to, to see how peoples had interacted or assimilated or been influenced by other peoples. As well as being fascinating, that must be a considerable challenge in using that sort of evidence in order to reconstruct a picture of how peoples interacted. One problem in particular for early periods is the jump from pots to people. If one, if one has a, a site in um, uh, Italy or Gaul or the Levant or Egypt, which has a large quantity of Greek pottery at it, what does that mean? Does that mean that this is a Greek settlement? Does that mean that this is a, a place that many Greeks were visiting, the Greek traders were visiting regularly? Or does this mean that the native inhabitants of whatever site this is are keen on Greek stuff and so import Greek pots? I suppose a subsidiary question then that comes from that is, well, if we can't answer that question precisely, as in many cases we can't, what does this movement of goods tell us about the kinds of peoples that are interacting with one another and where they're interacting? So even if we can't answer straightforward questions like, was Almina a Greek settlement? We can at least say Almina is the kind of place at which Greeks and Phoenicians are talking to one another and interacting and exchanging ideas and material goods. 
it, it seemed to me that you were, you were careful to emphasize the fact that just because there isn't physical linguistic evidence of a particular language and culture persisting may not mean that it didn't persist. It may simply be a fact that one written language took over, whereas the, the vernacular tongue persisted much longer than, than we, um, we might otherwise have thought. Well, that's, that's certainly true in the Italian peninsula, where Latin becomes the dominant language, and by the end of the Republic, so by time of Augustus, turn of the millennium, you get almost no more non-Latin written languages, but we don't actually know whether people in Pompeii, the time of the eruption, were still speaking non, some of them are still speaking non, non-Latin non or not. What we do know is that Latin was the prestige language in Italy and the West, just as Greek was the prestige language in the East. As you move from, from the Greek world to the Roman world, broadly speaking, and from, from pots to people, as, as you put it, Peter, does the set of questions you're pursuing change, or is it merely the, the material evidence which, which changes and that the historical record becomes richer? It changes in part because the emergence of a central controlling power, an empire, necessarily affects the storyline. Before Rome's extraordinary burst upon the world, upon the uh, Mediterranean and European stage in the second century BC, there had been competing powers. None of those powers had controlled as much territory as the Romans came to do. So that affects the storyline. The other thing which affects the storyline is the ongoing existence of other peoples who in the end become really important to the themes of this book, namely the Jews and then the Christians. It's the continued existence and growing importance of their views of the past, their construction of the past, which is one of the things that comes to the fore as we as the book proceeds. Now, one of the attractions of the book, for me, was the text boxes that you scatter throughout it, and they can have subjects ranging from Etruscan vases to Mussolini and the appropriation of the Roman past and Freud's experience of visiting Rome. I just wanted to ask you how you how you chose those subjects because obviously you have a you have several thousand years to, of of cultural appropriation to to pick from, and also what you were trying to do by uh, inserting those text boxes throughout the text. I think those those texts those, those, those text boxes on the reception and uses of the classical past in more modern periods are an absolutely central feature of the book and a central feature of what we were were trying to do one of the main themes of the birth of classical europe is the ways in which people in antiquity used and appropriated and abused and thought about and played with their own past and what they thought they knew about it what we describe in the introduction as a series of rolling pasts and one of the things that we were trying to do in those reception boxes was to show that this process is still an ongoing one, um, that there isn't a single monolithic classical past which we can learn straightforward lessons from, but the kind of lessons that we learn from it and the kind of things that we do with it and the kind of uses and abuses that we make of Greco-Roman antiquity are still changing all the time. And then at the level of how do we pick actual mm-hmm. topics, of course we had great fun because we had all sorts of things that we could play with. We tried to spread we tried to spread them through the different chapters. It was particularly interesting, though, with the second chapter on the Dark Age that follows the collapse of the palatial civilization in the, in the Aegean before the emergence of the Greek city-states. That, that Dark Age there, we actually didn't include any reception boxes because actually it's not been a period which people in in more recent epochs have made anything of. So even the absence of reception boxes is itself interesting. 